From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello. Welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They called me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Alexis, codenamed Doc Holiday Jackson. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. This week's strange news is a bit of a grab bag, more so than usual, folks. We've got a lot of Weird updates, some that may not become episodes, some that unfortunately are going to have to become episodes in the future. Uh, I was thinking, guys, we can ease into this a bit with some news that is not terrible and then go to terrible stuff. How, how do you feel? I like that trajectory just fine. Yeah. Okay, okay, great. So, so the first thing, I don't know about you guys, but I, I go through these intense phases of obsession and fascination with things. And one of the one of the phases that I've been going through is diving deep into interactions between intelligent animals and humans and then other animals with each other. Like how does, how would an octopus react to an elephant, right? How would those very intelligent creatures navigate each other? Kind of wonder if like the creators of Pixar films uh, go down similar rabbit holes when they're plotting out their, their movies. A hundred percent. Maybe they're doing <laughs> what happens again. I can't speak for everybody. Maybe they're doing something similar because sometimes you get so obsessed with something, you rationalize it by saying, I'll work this into, you know, a project later. Somehow the octopus will apply. Uh, it's funny because what we see can change, uh, can change our perception in ways that we don't understand. And that is what has inspired the Toronto Zoo to beg people to stop showing gorillas videos on their phones. Uh, if you go to the zoo now, you will see a sign that says, for the well-being of gorilla troop, please refrain from showing them any videos or photos as some content can be upsetting and affect their relationships and behavior within their family. Okay. First of all, this feels like advice that we should be taking for ourselves and also for our kids. <laughs> and the fact that the uh, the zoo is like first to market with this uh, hot take, I think is pretty amazing, hilarious, and a little sad. Mm -hmm. well, something my mom literally always said, hey, uh, watch what you put in there, talking about your brain, because it doesn't really come out. It's always going to be in there. That's astute. I like that. Well garbage done. Garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm sharing a uh, screen real quick here. This is a guy at a zoo who is showing an adult male gorilla pictures of female gorillas and uh, swiping when the gorilla tells him to swipe. Uh, it's, it went viral wow. temporarily as a <sighs> tenderilla. I mean, it's cute, but also like, it's kind of weird. I, I, I never occurred to me that this would be a trend that people would have this idea. I mean, it makes me think back to like Coco the gorilla, you know, and, mm -hmm. and like how Coco would do kind of human-y things like finger painting, but we don't finger paint anymore. We just look at our phones. So I guess this is sort of the modern version of that. Yeah, but we're like, we finger paint with our fingers on our phones, That's yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you have a finger painting app, perhaps, you know. Mm -hmm. Or just dirty or fingers. fingers. Well, I, I, just, I just mean the action is very similar, sure. right? To a, Tapped it, yeah. Yeah, primitive. Uh, I don't know. And uh, this is, okay, so here's, here's the video that broke the proverbial back of the zoo. <laughs> they have at Toronto Zoo a teenager. You can think of him as that, a teenage gorilla named Nasir. And Nasir is so into watching videos and seeing pictures on the phones of visitors that he has become a bit like a, a hikikomori in Japan. He's sort of withdrawn from the social life of the gorilla troop. This has apparently happened at a couple of other zoos in Chicago and other places around the world with the proliferation of cell phones. And if you think about it, 
most times when people go to a zoo these days, they are going to have their phone out because they want to, you know, document this stuff for later because wild animals are super cool. Yeah, but I never would have thought about flipping it the other way around. Like, that's just strange to me. This never would have occurred to me. Showing gorillas funny internet videos. The crown jewel, man, of this obsession right now, orangutan. They're amazing. They're so into uh, emulating human behavior. It, It becomes adorable, then heartbreaking, then disturbing, all at the same time. But we just wanted to give our friends at Toronto Zoo... A quick shout out and that that PSA, please, please, please <laughs> stop, stop showing gorillas thirst trap pictures of other gorillas on your phone. Just enjoy supporting wildlife um, for something completely different because we said we do funny stuff in the beginning or strange stuff. Um, do you guys like Burger King? You know, I actually do. It's, I think it's one of the superior fast food burgers, the flame broiled Whopper. Big fan. Literally, sorry, Burger King, but literally just the Whopper. Everything else, no thank you. Are you talking about the real cheeseburger, Ben? Yeah, I, oh, I yes, I never, uh, I never had a Whopper until uh, well into adulthood. I think, Matt, it may have been after we started making making this show in its original, um, its original format. And I just heard a commercial one time, and I'm so gullible for advertising. And I was like, huh. Yeah, when is the last time I had a Whopper? And you know what, Noel? It I thought it measured up to the hype. Uh, Burger King is Burger King in Thailand has decided to get pretty extreme with their cheeseburger. It's gone viral. CNN did a story on it. Uh, Noel, it sounds like you saw it too. It's too much cheese. As cheese fans, we say this: the real cheeseburger contains none of what you love about the Whopper if you love the actual patty and the char grilled thing. Instead, it's got a cheese, it's got a burger bun and 20 slices of American cheese. This is what you'd probably call stunt food, Mm -hmm. you know? Or like, uh, it's literally something that is designed just to raise some social media profiles. Yeah, that's crazy too that you mentioned that because, all right, this launched um, just a few days ago as we're recording on Wednesday, July 12th. And it's only three dollars. It's like three dollars and ten cents. People were saying it's a joke. They were saying it's a viral grab. And then Burger King got kind of terse on social media. They said, "This is no joke. This is for we real." We stand behind this. Yeah, like creation. like we yeah. studied this, you guys. Wow. And tw- Twenty slices is the they optimal just, number. They just need a rebrand. They've already got the Whopper. Let's just call it the Constipator, and we'll be done with it. And people will be like, "Oh man, I really need a Constipator." Yeah, I'm like different this is kinds bad. of cheese. <laughs> different kinds of cheese would be good. Well, I mean, you know, there's obviously a market for good gourmet grilled cheeses, which is just bread sure. and, and lots of cheese. This isn't that much different, but when you look at the marketing for it, the cheese slices like stand as some sort of stack, but you know that's not how it would come to you. No, it would be it, a it would... melty, gooey mess. It would not yeah. look the way it does a perfect, you know, stack like Scooby Doo style of cheese. Burger King also in the past has done things like the Halloween burger. I think it was like yeah, black, black, you know, black bun and all with squid ink or whatever. I mean, Burger King has been kind of uh, at the forefront of weird viral marketing ever since they did the weird King. Remember the King who looked like a serial killer? The creepy King. They yes. also uh, got into clowns for a while back in 2017. Uh, they got some weird OK Google ads. It's it's very strange. They campaigned for a Michelin star. Uh, now that now that we have had, if you are in Thailand, please, uh, we have some upcoming adventures in that part of the world, and we would love to hear how legit this burger is. If you can tell us without risking your physical safety, let us know what the king's opinion of Burger King is. Well, I would say it's not a burger. It's a it's a cheese sandwich. It is a burger yeah, requires some sort of patty, whether it be veggie or mm-hmm. whatever, some sort of formed patty thing. This is a grilled cheese at best. Yeah, and I don't know if they're even grilling it. Um, but the people, but people who do need to be grilled now, and we'll keep this brief okay. because okay. this may have to be an episode. Is uh, the government of Canada just going into our uh, strange news recording? This uh, evening, earlier earlier today, I learned the news is out. The Canadian government 
remember we did the episode on residential schools, on things like the Highway of Tears, and just the terrible way the government has treated First Nations and Indigenous people. It turns out that they have been forcibly sterilizing Indigenous women incredibly recently. Like, as we were actively creating this show in secret, they were uh, they were forcibly sterilizing women as recently as four years ago. And I don't think a lot of people in the U.S. had any idea. I, I certainly didn't. I think probably a lot of people worldwide had no idea. Mm-hmm. The story is still kind of coming out as far as what consequences will be like. We are going to keep our eye on it. Uh, this is an episode in the future. Because the scary How? thing. How? Yeah. And what, they're rounding but, them up and doing this? This just sounds like stuff that happens in the past, not anymore. Like, I don't even understand the mechanism by which this is accomplished. Right. Yeah, that's that's the problem. The We know that a lot of developed countries had an incredibly dense, in, insidious, uh, active net of conspiracies to oppress Native people to oppress what they considered minorities. Canada obviously is no different. But years, decades after a lot of these other rich countries stopped sterilizing indigenous women, the practice in Canada continued. There's currently five class action lawsuits going through the courts now. There are probably going to be more. Uh, I want to shout out the AP medical writer, Maria Chang, who did the original reporting on this. They got picked up. The Government of Canada had concluded that, quote, this horrific practice is not confined to the past, but is clearly continuing today. In May, a doctor was, as AP describes it, penalized for forcibly sterilizing an indigenous patient in 2019. That's how recent this is. And right now, this like because this came out, there are no solid estimates on how many people were affected by this. This is like removing their bloodlines, essentially, right? I mean, it's a, it's not, I don't want to be hyperbolic and call it genocide. It's not the same thing exactly, but it is a form of population control and trying to wipe out a, an unwanted element, you know, from society. And, you know, you usually think of the Canadians as being so chill. (laughs) We keep running into stories that says otherwise. Mm-hmm. Have either of y'all seen the show um, Reservation Dogs? Yes, on FX. I've, I've only watched a few episodes, and, and I think it's great. Um, but 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 it is uh, a story uh, about indigenous uh, people, uh, and that those stories are not often told, and those 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 folks are not often featured, you know, as the stars of their own series. Um, it is created by Sterling Harjo uh, and Taika Waititi, who of course is also in. in part of an indigenous culture uh, in New Zealand. Um, I recommend everybody checking it out. You know, I think it's uh, an important show. Yeah. And I, for the readers in the crowd, if you like horror, there's an excellent uh, native writer here in the U.S. Uh, who I've, I've actually, I've interviewed him um, for some previous horror related things. His name's Stephen Graham Jones. Awesome, awesome writer. Uh, check him out. And then also check out this AP article because, you know, a lot of folks don't think about it here in the U.S., But Uncle Sam was forcibly sterilizing Native American women uh, all the way up until the 1970s. History is way closer than it looks in the rearview mirror. And this may sound, you mentioned the idea of it being hyperbolic to call this stuff genocide. But Prime Minister Justin Trudeau also said it was genocide in 2019. And since then, since those speeches and those those grand barnstorming declarations, critics say very little has been done past uh, past lip service, which unfortunately is a tale as old as time. This is kind of a clarion call for our Canadian conspiracy realist. We would love to hear your reports on the ground about what is going on, how this is being handled in Canadian media by the Canadian government in your neck of the global woods and what you think the correct next steps should be and whether you think those steps are going to be enacted. Like we said, this is a grab bag. uh, So this um, future episode is going to depend on help from you folks. And 
The last thing, which I don't want to say almost anything about before we throw to uh, our first ad break, is a guy named Luft. Uh, his, he was, uh, this might be familiar to some people who've been following that Hunter Biden saga. He was a guy who said that the Biden family specifically was in deep with China. It was a Chinese asset. He's currently a fugitive on the run from the DOJ on suspicion of being a Chinese asset himself. Wow. Accuse the other of that which you yourself are guilty of. Yeah, he is a dual U.S. Israeli citizen. He evaded a couple of like we talked about this in the past, the Foreign Agent Registration Act. Like it's totally cool to rep another country in the U.S. and pursue their interests. But Uncle Sam wants you to be upfront and honest about it. He's also been charged with armed trafficking. He disappeared in Cyprus. He says oh, it's oh, all oh. a stitch up game and that he, the FBI is trying to shut him down through the DOJ because he told them because he blew the whistle on the Bidens. I'm sorry, Ben. I'm a dummy. I said, it's like, I, I hear arm trafficking and I'm thinking of body brokers, uh, but you're referring to ar- like armaments, like yeah, illegal weapons weaponry. Trade. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. It sounds like all of them are, what if all of them are assets? I was wondering that too, Matt. What if everybody, like, are you a Chinese asset? Or is, are we doing like a don't ask, don't tell on this No, show? but I mean like that whole, it would be really interesting if the guy who came out to like blow the whistle is actually... The thing that he's blowing the whistle on them about, but it's because he's like operating into Uh, who knows who knows which side he's actually working for. If he's got that many alliances or, you know, what's his who's who's his allegiance really to? Right, right. You get to that very murky world of tradecraft pretty quick. Like how many double crosses happen until you're all kind of just working together? Right. Mm -hmm. So. It's a good question, and it's something we would also like your thoughts on. one eight three three std wytk conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. We're going to pause for a word from our sponsor. We'll be back with episodes on these stories and more. But before then, who, buddy, we got to go to Twitter. And we're back with another piece of strange news, Ben. You nailed it, teased it before the break. It's about Twitter. I don't know if uh, if y'all out there in um, conspiracy realists land have been paying attention. You probably have. Uh, Twitter's been going through some some changes um, ever since our boy Elon Musk was forced by the government to buy it. The way it kind of played out, it sort of feels like he was flexing a bit, trying to, you know, stir or whatever, and then went a little too far and uh, was literally forced to to uh, conclude a deal that um, saddled him with with Twitter, a company that is notoriously, well, maybe not notoriously, but that has uh, historically been unable to turn much of a profit. Um, he's mega, mega in debt, billions in debt. Obviously, he is worth a lot of money, so it's not as big a deal to him, but still, he has been doing everything he possibly can to make the company turn a profit, much to the chagrin of people who have really loved and and relied on Twitter, Um, not the least of which is the whole idea of being able to purchase that coveted blue check mark, essentially rendering it useless in terms of identifying who actual people are, all kinds of shenanigans surrounding that and joke accounts popping up, you know, lookalike accounts that are like, you know, making a mockery of the whole thing. So Elon has not come out looking super good in, in many of the decisions, um, if not all of the decisions he has made. Yeah. Answering, uh, answering media requests with the poop emoji, cutting uh, essential staff. Uh, like Twitter's version of essential workers, asking Mark Zuckerberg in all honesty if they could measure each other's penises. Mm-hmm. Not That's exactly. The latest, yeah. yeah, not exactly Fortune 500 stuff, right? Yeah, it's not what you not, want. Not particularly subtle either. And, you know, Elon Musk, is his whole deal is that he is a an unapologetic uh, supporter of free speech. Um, and that is what he wants to promote on Twitter, is make it a place of complete and unfettered free speech, which uh, unfortunately means hate speech. Um, ever since Elon took over, the proliferation of hate speech, which was already a problem on Twitter, that was you know, being handled. There were whole teams d- devoted to 
dealing with that kind of stuff and making sure that those kinds of things were dealt with in terms of services and all of that. Um, but now it seems like a, like a massive free for all and uh, just hate speech running rampant. And, you know, he, he had a whole debacle over Fourth uh, of July weekend where he was trying to I don't know exactly what he did exa- specifically, but essentially it amounted to doing a, a denial of service attack on his own company um, in order to, he said he accused, you know, other companies of like scraping them for data. So he basically made it where you could only certain users that didn't have the blue check mark could only look at tweets a certain number of times per day. And people that did have it could look at it more. It seems like his goal was to make it where you had to be logged in to use Twitter or to maybe encourage more people to buy the blue check mark. But that's not what we're talking about today. Um, Mark Zuckerberg fast tracked, it would seem, a Twitter clone um, that also was pushed out over Fourth of July weekend called Threads. Um, because of the fact that it's linked directly to Instagram, people's Instagram accounts. And it was really easy just by the click of a button to make an, a, a Threads account and immediately be following anybody that you're already following on Instagram on Threads. Um, Instagram being a platform that has, I believe, approaching a billion users, one of the most popular social media platforms in the world. Yeah, uh, 2.35 this- billion. Oh, wow. Okay. So surpassing a billion, 2.35 billion. Um, This was a really crafty way of getting a massive amount of users very quickly uh, and essentially surpassed Twitter. Because Twitter's always been a bit more of a niche kind of service, you know, and people like it because it has a certain vibe. Um, It's obviously been very important in world events, you know, like the Arab Spring and uh, the ability of people to speak truth to power on it. Um, Well, (laughs) this whole idea of Elon being a proponent of free speech and that sort of being the selling point of what Twitter is, uh, has is taken a very interesting turn in that uh, the Taliban has come out um, in full throated support uh, Mm -hmm. of Twitter saying, hey, we're not, don't worry about us, Elon. We got your back. We're not going to threads because Meta, the company that of course used to be Facebook, uh, is intolerant. Right. Well, yeah, Taliban's with Twitter for the free speech. They like the free speech. It says uh, there was a statement from, I believe, sort of a philosophical leader in the Taliban, a guy by the name of Anas Haqqani. Um, Yeah, he's he's described in this Vice article as a thought leader uh, with family connections to um, higher up leadership. He came out in a tweet uh, in in support of Twitter saying uh, Twitter has two important advantages over other social media platforms. The first, this is an English language post, by the way. The first privilege is the freedom of speech. The second privilege is the public nature and credibility of Twitter. Uh, Twitter doesn't have an intolerant policy like Meta. Other platforms cannot replace it. Um. So, yeah, depending on your view of the Taliban, um, <laughs> the idea that they're talking about, I mean, aren't they kind of intolerant by their very nature? Isn't what? that sort of their thing? The, ta- what, the Taliban? Hold yeah. thy tongue. Yeah. And just full disclosure, you know, I uh, often I think probably because neither of these groups have been in the news nearly as much as they were, um, you know, in my 20s. In my head, I sometimes conflate uh, the Taliban with Al Qaeda. And I know they're two Muslim extremist groups. They have some things in common, but they also have many things uh, that are very different about them. So if we could just maybe, Ben, help us out. Let's do a little bit of a, a background on the Taliban. Sure. Yeah. So the the Taliban kind of starts as a movement of religious students from some specific parts of Afghanistan. They were uh, instructed in traditional Islamic schools. It's very common for this time. And they saw a lot of horrific things when Afghanistan was a, a proxy battlefield for Russia and for the U.S. And it's been constantly besieged by outside powers throughout much of modern history. What they wanted to do was originally do, um, they come from what's called Pashtun nationalism. Let's let's have a government or a, a governing system, a regime for the people who live here, by the people who live here. The name Taliban literally means something like seekers of knowledge or students of Islam. But they have been off and on supported by the CIA, by the ISI, which is like the the Pakistani CIA. Um, We've mentioned them in the past 
because they had done things like um, crack down on the opium trade, right? Poppies are huge, a huge cash crop in that part of the world. They crack down on it. They also are notorious now for going back on their word when they when they became, for all intents and purposes, the state government of Afghanistan. They claimed that they were going to have some slightly more progressive social uh, policies, and they went back on them almost immediately. The treatment of women uh, by the Taliban government is absolutely horrendous and inhumane. Uh, there was there are still lots of restrictions on employment, closing down schools. It's it's just a it, it's a heartbreaking, un, and in my head, unsustainable situation. But that's that's the broad strokes of the Taliban. Like you said, there's a lot more to get into, and it gets into the murky world of geopolitics very quickly. It is weird to think about the Taliban now as more of a state government than anything yeah. else, because once the U.S you know, pulled out in 2021, this is this enemy that we've been fighting since we invaded, you know, 20, 20 years before that. And now they pretty much run, run the whole show there. And there it's, this isn't a full representative of the Taliban that's making this statement, right? This is somebody who is, who, who is a high, you know, who is high up there in, as you said, as a thought leader, but it's a state government basically saying, no, we're going to use Twitter because all these other platforms won't have us, basically. It's very weird. He's like the Steve Bannon. He's kind of like a Steve mm, Bannon. Interesting. Right? He's, I think the language they use in some of the reporting is he has no government portfolio, which is just a fancy way of saying he doesn't have an official government position, but he's hanging heavy with mm. those decision makers. Yeah, in fact, in this uh, Vice article by uh, Matthew Galt, there's a little, um, I guess, correction they did. It says this article originally called Haqqani a leader of the Taliban. His role is more philosophical. That's how they describe it. But Matt, you're exactly right. Facebook and TikTok both internally see the Taliban as a terrorist organization, which is interesting considering, you know, your point, Ben, they are also a government. Um, so they've, they've been banned for some time, and that ban uh, is, is still very much in place. But the Taliban has um, historically, or at least in, in recent history, um, leaned pretty heavily on using social media to push their agenda. Um, in fact, the, in the article by Galt, um, he points out that some uh, Taliban fighters have kind of griped a little bit about the fact that they're spending more time in front of the computer, you know, waging information war than they are actually out, you know, in the field, you know, waging actual <laughs> That's kind of funny. It is kind of funny, yeah. Especially, I mean, funny in a very specific, dark way, because a lot of times in some of these extremist factions, like there, people don't want to hear this, but uh, these tremendously evil organizations, uh, members or people who join those have reasons that from their perspective are, are valid, you know, like foreign oppressors killed by family, things like that, right? Push people toward radicalization and extremism. And imagine having made that decision to yourself that you are going to sacrifice your own life for a greater good. And your first day on the job, they say, okay, you're in charge of these Twitter bot accounts. We have lunch at 1145 sharp. (laughs) You get two 15 minute breaks throughout the day. Wasn't there a thing recently where like Taliban fighters went on like a day trip and were riding like swan boats and stuff at some kind of amusement park? Oh, I didn't see that one. I think that's right. And they're like holding machine guns. Maybe, maybe I'm pretty sure that it was the Taliban. They like there was I think it was another Vice article where it had these incredible photographs of these. It reminds me of like the picture of Billy Corgan looking really sad on a roller coaster, but this is like, you know, fully garbed up Taliban fighters with heavy weaponry uh, riding around on like Tunnel of Love <laughs> type swan boats at some sort of amusement park. Very, very, very uh, surreal stuff. Um, but uh, in the article uh, on Vice, um, Aram Shabanian, um, who is an OSINT manager at New Lines Institute, which is essentially a open source kind of fact, uh, open source information gathering is what that stands for. Yeah, um, like strategy. Cat. Yeah. Exactly. He uh, was quoted as saying that uh, he was surprised that the Taliban would endorse the, quote, up and coming warlordism of Elon Musk's Twitter. 
Uh, I don't know if he's being funny or coy there, uh, but it's it's a cool quote. And, you know, lately Musk has been going pretty ham on liking and retweeting and responding to anyone that, that throws shade at uh, Mark Zuckerberg. He called him Zuck the Cuck or whatever. And, you know, a lot of like schoolyard bully kind of talk. But kind of doubt that he's retweeting this Taliban thing might be a bridge too far <laughs> or a, a little too on the nose of uh, you know how people are starting to view Musk. But it's definitely a sign of, of the direction that Twitter is, is, uh, is heading. So I don't know if you guys had anything else to, to add before we, uh, we move on. But interesting story. And, and honestly, we probably do are due for a, a, a Twitter story because boy, the history of it in and of itself, you know, where it came from and now where it's ended up uh, pretty fascinating stuff and on a very short timeline. So agreed, agreed. And it's happening so quickly, right? Because the, the feedback loops are tighter and tighter and tighter. And what, uh, you know, the idea of a terrorist group becoming a government no, Matt, just to throw in um, one thing that might ruffle some feathers here, the United States was started by a terrorist group as far well, as the rest of the world was concerned. One person's terrorist group is another person's freedom fighter or, or liberator. You know, we, we've always said that. Um, and honestly, the, the Nazis were a terrorist group, you know, who governed a, a country. Now, I was doing some Googling or just some rabbit holing on the Nazis uh, the, mm-hmm. yesterday, just like you do. I think I think it was Goebbels. I, I mentioned in the last segment that this quote, uh, accuse the other of that which you yourself are guilty of. It's just a oh, classic yeah you know, propaganda technique, you know, and it's something that we're seeing a lot in certain political rhetoric these days. And I didn't realize that Goebbels and his wife poisoned all of their children Mm -hmm. and then took their own lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, just monstrous, monstrous people. But gosh, sorry to leave on such a bummer, but um, definitely going to keep an eye on this Twitter situation. And maybe we can talk about doing a, a, a deeper dive into it. But let's take a break, hear a word from our sponsor, and then come back with one more piece of strange news. And we've returned a couple quick updates, guys. Do you remember back in December 2022, we made one of these strange news episodes and we talked about how there were several very popular tax filing websites like uh, Tax Slayer, H&R Block and Tax Act that have been sending users information, you know, over to Meta slash Facebook mm-hmm. and Google. Mm-hmm. Super well, crooked. Super oh, crooked. Yeah. Super weird. It was the Metapixel. That's what, that's what it was embedded in yeah. their websites. Automatically sent info. Well, there was a congressional hearing and the good old folks at the Capitol have shared their report after they compiled it. You can read all about it on CNN and we'll read a bit from something written by Brian Fung on Wednesday, July 12th. It's titled Tax Prep Companies Shared Private Taxpayer Data with Google and Meta for Years. Congressional Probe Finds. Here's some quotes. Using visitor tracking technology embedded in their websites, TaxSlayer, H&R Block, and Tax Act allegedly sent tens of millions of Americans' personal information to the tech industry without their consent or appropriate disclosures. What personal information, you may ask? Well, names, phone numbers, email addresses, and all that taxpayer data, like filing status, adjusted gross income, the size income, of their tax right? refunds, right. and even information about the buttons and text fields they clicked on while filling out their tax forms, which means they know exactly what breaks, like tax breaks you're getting, like super personal information about companies that you have under your control and all this other stuff, uh, and which government programs you use on a regular basis. Is it anonymized at all? I'm sure the, The first, like, paper tiger defense. So the yeah, metadata, yeah. right? Like the yeah, idea yeah, it's just can, metadata. Can, yeah, yeah. But it's your, but it's your phone number and your name and your email address tied to all that stuff too. But so. who could it be? <laughs> yeah. Is it, is it the other Philo from Byzantium? Uh, like that's yeah. I, I just want to note here, Matt, that um, we called this a while back because there was already such crooked privatization of the IRS and paying taxes. And would so would this stuff be useful? for targeting a specific individual, or is it more like this is useful for measuring macro trends and leveraging them for profit? 
Well, it's a couple of things that were happening there with both companies, Meta and Google, or Alphabet, I guess. Meta and Alphabet and Google and Facebook. Uh, they were using it to target ads at individuals, highly targeted, right? We know everything about you, so we know exactly what you need. Take it. Uh, but also to train some of their language learning models and their machine learning Ooh. stuff that they had going on. So it was being used in a lot of different ways, at least according to that congressional hearing, which this report was written about. And just give you a little bit more from that CNN article. It says the report, which drew on congressional interviews and written testimony from these companies, Meta and Google and the tax prep companies. They also found that every single taxpayer who used tax acts, IRS free service while the tracking was enabled had their information shared with the tech company. So every single one, including guess who boys? Oh, uh, Matty Fred. Oh yeah. I was going to say also full disclosure. This is important. We need to say this. We have in the past had uh, some of those companies as sponsors. Also and it owners. Used to be owned by a company <laughs> that uh, I believe tax, sla- tax act. It is tax. tax act. I can- yeah. Tax act. That's right. No longer, but yeah. And I've, I've used, those in the past. I've only just recently pivoted to having an individual do it for me just because my, my stuff has gotten a little more complicated. Um, and I just, I'm afraid that I'm going to screw something up with that free version. Yeah. Every year I, I just uh, opt for trial by combat, hmm. Smart. which, you know, which a lot of people I think don't know you can do. It's like yeah. jury nullification. And, and you can, not, you can get a champion to represent you in the, uh, in the battle. You pit. can, but the rules change a little bit and I'm kind of hands on. You um, got to be careful. The IRS has some bruisers in their ranks. They uh, do. Uh, they do. <laughs> if you want to read the whole thing, you can head on over to Senator Elizabeth Warren's dot gov website. I think that's Warren dot Senate dot gov. Uh, you can find it or you can even search for it and just find attacks on tax privacy. How the tax prep industry enabled meta to harvest millions of taxpayers sensitive data. Okay. There's update one. There's a, there's a hearing. It doesn't really mean anything, but it's official now. And all that's all Ooh. this stuff, uh, the statements are now on record and you can read so them. No penalties yet. Well, there will be penalties. I'm just not sure when and what. Is it a Wells Fargo type situation? Ah, like, ah, what ah, a segue. Funny, funny you should say that. Funny okay. you should say that. Back in May 2020, we made an episode titled Wells Fargo's Imaginary Customers. Funny story. The bank was opening bogus accounts in existing customers' names, you know, because of internal pressure to sell more financial products, a.k.a. Right. accounts. Right. Well, guys, it appears that Bank of America has been caught doing that, too. And some other things. Uh, there's something you can read out of CNBC, written by Hugh Sun. It's titled, Bank of America Find $150 Million for Consumer Abuses, Including Fake Accounts, Bogus Fees. Uh, yeah. So, Jeez. I, I just mentioned Wells Fargo thing in terms of like what penalties might come. This is... Uh, another story entirely separate from the, the tax prep. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, uh, Meta and I think it. I think it is Meta. I don't know if Alphabet slash Google is caught up in it, but they are being fined by several European countries uh, right now, dealing with some of the same uh, same problems, but not yes. the tax, not the tax issues. It doesn't Europe have a little bit more protection for its citizens for this kind of thing? They take 100%. it a bit more seriously, perhaps. Threads isn't bit. even in Europe. Yeah right now um they have a different oh you know what matt that's a good setup they have a different philosophy of what should be protected there you go that's exactly correct um so let's jump into this just a little bit longer with the bank of america thing Uh, i'm gonna read from hugh sun's cnbc article here the bank charged multiple 35 dollar overdraft fees for the same transaction which means they double dipped charged 70 dollars because you didn't have enough money in your account so now you owe an extra 70 dollars congratulations were they hoping people wouldn't notice i don't know yeah part of it's hoping people notice and then part of it is also uh from my understanding reading about this part of it is an earlier grift that other banking institutions have been caught with with um futzing with the order of operations for how money goes into or away from uh, a debit or a checking excuse me account mm. such that you know if if you arrange the uh expenses or withdrawals in a certain order then you can hit the tripwire for the overdraft fee and sometimes create a feedback loop of overdraft fees. Uh, overdraft fees are a huge source of revenue 
yeah. for these retail banking institutions. There, there's nothing else associated with it, right? The, there's no product or service or anything. It's just, oh, now you owe us more money. Okay, well, we'll just throw that in the pot of revenues, I guess. Um, Probably like the way credit card companies clean up on late fees and stuff like that. Sure. Same Z's. So also, Bank of America, according to this article, failed to properly issue rewards to credit card users and signed up customers for card accounts without their consent. Oh, that's the old Wells Fargo move. Don't do that. Uh, and this is all according to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um Let's see. They Bank of America was ordered to pay a total of one hundred and fifty million dollars in penalties to that bureau, as well as the office of the comptroller of the currency, which sounds really exciting. Uh, But it also has to pay 80 million dollars to all these customers who were unfairly charged bogus fees on top of another twenty three million. It already paid to customers who were denied card awards. Woohoo! And that's not going to break the bank not a, even a not little even tiny no. crack uh, it's not gonna hurt unless <laughs> minimum punishment is 100 times the amount of financial or is 100 percent of the financial damage done it is after all the bank the of entire america you know it is the yeah. bank of it's like the iron bank i mean, I mean it's i'm joking yeah. but it's a biggie it's a big one it, it should be something like for each fifty million in fees you have to pay a regulatory agency, a bank has to sacrifice one C suite employee. I'm yeah, someone <laughs> one person should go to prison, right? Like like we're per saying 50 what, million. If, what if the horrific practices applied to racehorses were also applied to jockeys and racehorse owners? You know what I mean? Make it you have to make it physical and real because a lot of these there is parkour level passing of the buck when large institutions like this get into financial hot water. And because of the way the internal organizations and hierarchies are arranged, because of the insidious practice of information siloing, it's a lot of plausible deniability. It's actually really tough to put people at that level in jail for financial crimes unless their victims are also wealthy. Hashtag Madoff. Mm. Oh, snap. That's the truth. Welcome to it. Thank you, Ben. All right. If you want to read that entire (laughs) press release from the CFPB, you can head over to their newsroom at consumerfinance.gov. Guys, I'm so glad we talked about the European Union and uh, privacy laws that are a little bit different from ones that we experience over here or ones that govern us, because here's the main story for today. This is coming from lamonde.fr. France set to allow police to spy through phones. French lawmakers agreed to a justice reform bill that includes a provision granting police the power to get suspects geolocation through phones and other devices. And it's not just geolocation, guys. It's It's actual footage. It's turning on the cameras on a phone or any other device, a tablet, a computer, a connected webcam, the way Mm. we're all using them right now turning on the microphones to record audio for monitoring and spying of some of a suspect in a particular case. It is much more complicated than, hey, you should be afraid that the French government is going to turn on your devices because they are almost 100% not going to do that unless you are suspected of terrorist activities or not organized, convicted. not convicted, suspected. Somebody in an office somewhere is like, wait a second. I think this piece of evidence matches up with this piece of evidence. And we got this name and it's that guy. Turn on his phone. Listen Uh, carefully, Paul, mission control. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) seriously. Your phone is on. Uh Oh, is this a warning to Paul? (laughs) Moving on. I mean, this is like this, you know, word from a friend. Right. But this this is something we talked about previously whenever these mass data scoops or um, digital invasion. That's what I think we can call it. Digital invasions come up, which are cyclical in uh, shorter and shorter intervals in between. Uh, The question becomes, who decides someone is suspicious, right? To your point, Matt. And uh, we were talking about this off air. Matt, surely there's some kind of robust, working, accessible, transparent appeals process for this 
Is there any way for you to know if you're being observed or is that part no. of the psyopy nature of it? No, you won't know because you're you're literally under investigation. It is like a wiretap kind of situation, right? So so a, uh, a according to this bill, which is a large bill, right? This isn't just a bill that's getting passed that says, hey, we can spy on your cameras and your uh, your phones now and all that stuff. This is a reform bill, right? Like a, mm -hmm. like a, almost like one of these big defense uh, bills that the oh, U.S. See, passes. Sorry. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, like the like when the um, the budget has to pass Congress. There's a lot of stuff that's tacked into this, and that's very that's very much by design. It's not necessarily always malevolent. Sometimes it's just like, hey, let's get everything done at once while we're here. But an inherent part of this that pretty much every Western government does is uh, use the large amount, uh, like use a large size bill as cover fire to sneak in some things that would never pass if they were proposed on their own. Pork, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't that what they call it? Like the, the extra Yeah, pork stuff. is uh, sweetheart spending deals. And okay. this is stuff like, um, like, oh, hey, the nation of the United States is clearly on the same page after the terrorist attacks on 9-11 Let's call something the Patriot Act and then put in all the other shit we wanted to do for years. Mm. Yeah, I, this this one's a little weird to me, guys. I, I'm going to read a little bit more from this LeMond article because I think I think there's maybe a gray area here that even I'm leaning in a way that I didn't expect to be leaning. OK, so mm -hmm. let, let's just mm -hmm. get into this. The article says any use of the provision must be approved by a judge while the total duration of the surveillance cannot exceed six months and sensitive professions, including doctors, journalists, lawyers, judges, and MPs would not be legitimate targets. So that's yeah. members of parliament, by the way, MPs. Yeah. And didn't they say that this would, from the way they're imagining it, this affects a very small number of uh people in france yeah it was tight i i want to say it was like a dozen or two dozen people or something yeah, like ridiculously small. small number because again they're focusing on primarily at least they are saying according to the brains behind this portion of the bill they're targeting those suspected of terrorist acts or planning terrorist acts in the future those who are in organized crime involved pretty seriously in that kind of thing or this is weird they also throw delinquency in there Delinquency mm. could mean a lot of different things. Like, like bills, like uh, or like like having outstanding uh, debts. What's that? What's that Black Lips song? Bad kids. Yeah, oh, yeah, being, yeah. Bad loitering. Kids. What are we talking here? What is yeah, del delinquency yeah. is is a very broad term. Well, that's what I, I mean. I think it's related to the protest. Ah, I think it is too. Setup. And yeah, that's yeah, what yeah, I'm. Yeah. That's what makes me really nervous about this, because mm -hmm. theoretically you could cast a pretty wide net if you wanted to, if there was some kind of organized movement, like with the protests occurring, and you could just decide to turn on all of those things to figure out where everybody is, their geolocation, like literally Ooh. conversations about planning another protest. Uh, you could take video evidence that, depending on how you maneuver the law, there you could use in court. Um, um, earlier when I, when I said like, doesn't, ha doesn't Europe or France have different laws or they're a little more particular about what is considered private. I was saying that as a positive, like I thought, you know, mm -hmm. they were more concerned with their citizens ability to be private, but this is flying in the face of that. Or maybe I'm just naive. Well, there's, yeah. yeah, they have better protections for predatory practices by private industry. Okay. Yes. That's probably the best way to say it. But as Got far it. as the power of the state, um, the EU is going through going through some foundational challenges right now. France has a has had a huge wave of protests and riots. Um, some most directly set off by the raising of the retirement age which was, uh, is a huge deal. And then um, there's a lot of anti-immigration, racism. There's like Muslim separatists in the mix. France has valid reasons to be worried about its continued stability. Uh, the question is, how much do you want to change what you said were your principles in pursuit of, um, of retaining your stability of state. I mean, it'd be really yeah. interesting to talk with people on the ground in France about this.
No oh, doubt. yeah, I, I think so. It, it's really messed up because my mind goes through what what would I be willing to do to prevent some massive attack on a train, right? Or on some other public transportation or something like that or another 9-11. What would I be willing to give up to know that I could stop that? But this isn't a situation where you would know you would stop that. You would have to have investigations that lead to suspects that then get targeted, that then you could prevent another attack or something like that, right? And it's a slippery yeah. slope argument where it's, it's like, you know, yeah. because of the vague nature of like what it means to be suspected of these things often or the lack of definition around mm. it, it could be used nefariously. Of course. You know? And I'm I'm glad that we're all on the same page here because years back when we did our uh, deep dive into torture, does torture work? Mm-hmm. I brought up that point as well. Like the idea is... If you prevent one of these attacks, then unless it seems like it was definitely going to happen, the public's not going to appreciate it, right? It's like if you, um, to take it in a couple of different examples, what if you have a terrible nightmare that one of your friends is going to get in a car wreck and you call them that morning and you say, hey, work from home today, don't drive. They don't drive, so they don't get in a car wreck, but they're not going to think you're psychic necessarily because the thing you prevented never happened it's like if you travel back in time to kill adolf hitler they're not going to say thank you for stopping nazis they're going to say who is this strange man who shot a baby you know (laughs) and they're gonna they're gonna be thinking like to your excellent example matt like this question of this the ticking time bomb scenario right we always we always worry about that you we also we mentioned this in the book no one wants to be the person who says, I could have saved thousands of lives, but I just had to play by the rules and the red tape. Because if you don't break those rules at that time, then you are the villain. You know what I mean? It's a very profound ethical dilemma, in my opinion. Yeah. And I think at this point in 2023, if there's anyone out there that doesn't believe Every phone call we make, every text we send, every email we receive, every WhatsApp, every supposedly end-to-end encrypted message isn't being intercepted by a government agency, we're probably fooling ourselves. Because we didn't learn about all the things that were actually happening just like that until a whistleblower came forward and told us it was happening decades ago. So, I mean, it's kind of messed up. I I don't like it. but No, I mean... Privacy is somewhere between an historical fad and uh, an exclusive domain of the very wealthy, right? <laughs> yeah, that's. I I think it's it's true. You know, you have if you are listening to this show or if you exist in any kind of non point zero zero one percent echelon, you have been recorded without your consent nor your knowledge. It's just statistically inevitable. And, and is sometimes it cool? you know, Absolutely and you just got to throw up your hands and go, well. Great. Mm-hmm. Hope you enjoyed that poop. Sometimes it's not the folks you suspect or the entities. Man, Matt, what a what a rich tapestry of shit you brought us today, my friend. <laughs> that was uh, a, lot, a lot of fun. Uh, Go jump in the river. As we said, this is a kind of grab bag, strange news segment. We've touched on a lot of things. and We've asked for a lot of help from people around the world. Uh, We can't wait for you to be part of the show, folks. Join us. Uh, You are the reason this show exists. We're so grateful that you're here. We try to be easy to find online. That's right. You can find us at the handle Conspiracy Stuff on Twitter. Uh, yeah, not not threads yet, I don't think, but uh, Twitter for, for the moment. Got that free speech going for them. Um, we're also Conspiracy Stuff on YouTube, where there's always fun video content popping up, um, as well as Facebook. We're Conspiracy Stuff Show on Instagram and TikTok. Hey, do you like calling with your phone knowing it's going to be recorded by some governmental agency or language learning model somewhere? Why not use that passion to call us? Our number is 1-833-STDWYTK. It's a voicemail system. You got three minutes. Give yourself a cool name, not your government name. They already have that on file. We do not, and we don't want it on file. 
Please let us know at some point in the message if we can use your name and message on the air. If you don't want to do that, why not instead send us a good old-fashioned email? We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.